Okay, this is the pre-class video, class number 11. Our last day on humanism, we're going to talk about Martin Luther King Jr.'s version of Christian humanism, and then I'll, I'll mostly, uh, this class is going to involve each of you finding your own version of humanism <clears throat> and presenting approximately a uh, one paragraph, more formal presentation of your view of what you found. I'll grade you on your oral presentation. And then other students will ask questions. So at least three other students need to ask a question. Um, so we'll start out with Martin Luther King, and then we'll move on to the different varieties of humanism. Um, and I would like you to say, you know, why did you pick that version? Uh, why is it interesting to you? Do you think our society would be better or is better because there are this type of humanists are around engaged in public life and trying to move the climate of the society in the direction that they believe in, that they're committed to? All right, so uh, here we go. I always, I always set it all up and then, whoops, then I have to, okay, here we go. <clears throat> uh, okay, Martin Luther King. This is um, his letter from a Birmingham jail is truly a classic because it takes the most basic principles of Western intellectual tradition and it applies them to a current event. So you're not getting stuck in the past, but you do have these same trends that keep um, adapting to changes. And that is what our founders wanted, as I said. They were humanists, and the Christian part or the religious part was fine, but you don't, but leave it at the doorway of the courthouse or the schoolhouse. Um, just leave it at the church because those ideas can get fixated and they can get focused on some supernatural realm that takes energy away from people. It takes their desire to work together to make the world a better place and their capacity to actually be rational and do a good job of it. So you, we have religious toleration, but we really, the humanists emphasized, let's make this work. While they were writing their constitution, someone said, gentlemen, we are creating a science of government. Absolutely new that nobody had ever done this before. This was completely cutting edge. I don't know how I can impress on you how radically progressive this was. All right, so um, King took those principles and moved them forward. He also interpreted the Bible. And I'll show you, he's a prophet. He's just like the old biblical prophets. He has the same spirit. He has the same union of reason and faith. He has the same belief in God, but belief that God wants him to call out injustices, just like the prophets. Um, and then the other point I want to make is that the techniques that Martin Luther King used have been used over and over again for many different nonviolent movements since then. There was one called ACT UP, which was about uh, when gay people were dying from AIDS and it kept getting uh, silenced and denied and repressed. There were demonstrations that somebody's got to do the research, somebody's got to find some drugs, somebody's got to get this out of the closet so we can deal with this problem. Then the Black Lives Matter also. Um, Many of the leaders who had also been in the civil rights movement were using the same techniques. Um, 
Although the media, well, I do want to point out, if you, if you say the media didn't portray it that way, it came across as violent. You know what? The same thing happened in the 60s. I was there, I know. And so when the students were saying, oh, but it was better in the past. No, no, it wasn't. It was actually worse. Um, because there was more violence in the past and there was more, um, there were people, plenty of uh, Blacks who didn't want to uh, rebel. They were much more conditioned to be subservient. They were more afraid of the price to pay. And also there were Blacks in the Black Power Movement who really thought Martin Luther King was wrong because they wanted to be violent. And um, there was the study from Princeton that I heard was that 93% of the demonstrations were actually nonviolent. And of course, because of social media and these videos, it can give you the impression that the whole thing was violent because that's the only part you see. So that's important. Um, again, television in the 60s did some of that, but not television can't take things out of context the way a phone can. A phone can just focus on one little thing and you could have this whole peaceful demonstration and all, all a person sees about that demonstration is this particular um, act of violence or pushing people around or something. So, so you really have to step back, find out what is the research saying, um, what is really going on. But here was the process by which King um, educated. Okay, so um, in Black Lives Matter, people were talking about outsiders. <laughs> And the people from the movement way back said, wait a sec, wait a sec. That's what they said about Martin Luther King. Um, and so some of those outsiders, many of them were people from elsewhere who wanted to participate in the demonstrations, which is great. Some of them were, however, undercover police officers that wanted to incite violence. And that happened in the 60s. There were FBI and CIA agents that were plain clothes people. They looked like just civilians and they tried to incite violence um, because they wanted the movement to fail and they wanted it to get a reputation for being violent. So um, I want you to know this stuff because it's going to happen again. There are going to be more demonstrations. Keep this stuff in mind or save it on your machine, right? Take a look back every time there's another demonstration. What are the patterns here? Is it playing out again? And it will be, you know? Then you deplore the demonstrations, but not the conditions that cause them. So that, yeah, I mean, how are we gonna solve this problem of pitting the underclass against the working class and pitting um, blacks who live in toxic neighborhoods because of systemic racism in housing against police officers that are often um, have a career in military, they're retired military. So they have PTSD or they could, right? They have triggers, they have fear. Um, but then, you know, are you compounding it? Are you making worse? Are there community policing efforts where police officers become friends with the people in their precinct? The people in the precinct can trust them. They can report to each other each day about what's going on. I mean, there's lots of ways to solve all of this, anim not all of it, but a lot of this unnecessary animosity. And I'm sure it's actually being done. And I'm sure a lot of, but the majority are working on that. But everything blew up at a certain point. Another difference I was aware of is that African-Americans have made inroads. And um, there were a lot of interviews with obviously professional African-Americans, which is no big deal to you, but it was to me because 
50 years ago, there weren't as many lawyers, doctors, women, men, mayors, governors, US Congress people, um, business leaders, all sorts of civic leaders that were African American, and that was great. Um, but still, there's still the ghettos, there's still these toxic neighborhoods, and um, there's still problems. All right, so he had a campaign of four steps. And I don't know if Black Lives Matter got that organized, but I would imagine that there were certain subgroups in various states that probably organized um, uh, preparation. So first of all, there's fact gathering. Do the injustices exist? Then they try to negotiate. Then they have these workshops where they learn how to, if, you know, they, they practice animosity and and getting hit without reacting so that um, you can stop the violence and so that you won't get accused of being the cause of the violence. They have to turn the other cheek. They have to make clear that where is which side the aggression is on if they want to be effective. Um, okay, so King tried uh, direct action, he postponed it. He gave the city of Birmingham a chance to really change, it didn't work. Um, then they were accused of breaking laws, but the, the Jim Crow laws, the Southerners were breaking, uh, following state laws, but those state laws were illegal since 1954 but they always get accused of being breaking laws. Um, the moral, okay, and King says, we have a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. Well, Socrates felt we have, he had a moral responsibility to speak out against, in his case, it wasn't the laws that were unjust, it was the application of the laws. In the case of Jim Crow laws, it was the laws that were illegal and they needed to be in to conform to the Supreme Court. But also there's a higher law, there's the law of God. Um, so there are human laws, but they are accountable to natural laws and the law of God, okay. An unjust law is a force, um, power, the powerless are forced to obey, but the powerful don't obey themselves. That's unjust. We have to have equal treatment under the law. Um, the unjust law was voted in by a minority, but everyone was forced to obey it. And so all those ways that Blacks were not able to vote. Um, and still we have a whole lot of voter suppression laws and decisions and policies that are making harder, making it harder for minorities to vote. We have gerrymandering. There's just a systematic effort to make it more difficult for African Americans to get representatives in the state and uh, national legislation, les, legislations, <laughs> legislature, and also to um, be able to vote and be able to participate. Okay, there are laws that seem to be just, but the way they're applied. So in the case of um, Birmingham, there was a law that you can't parade without a permit. But when Martin Luther King went to ask for a permit, he wouldn't get one, of course. So he had to parade without a permit. Well, then the police can come and arrest him. And then it turned into violence, but it didn't need to, it shouldn't have. He didn't want that, but at the end of the day, you have you have an obligation to break an unjust law. You do it openly, you accept the penalty, just like Socrates, and then your conscience forces you to break it, just like Socrates. He knew he was gonna get killed for going out and asking people embarrassing questions. Um, he was, King is really mad at the white moderates because they say they care about justice, but they don't want any kind of disruption. Um, and King says, you know, 
you can't be obsessed about the absence uh, about tension because if a society is growing and adapting then there has to be tension now some of you were talking about chaos i don't think chaos is necessarily is necessary but tension is always necessary you should never get too comfortable um, but i don't see any of my students uh, getting too comfortable anytime soon um, Usually it takes a while before you get set in your ways. Um, the present tension is a transition to bring up, you know, to actually bring about change. He gets accused of precipitating violence. And that always happens whenever there are demonstrations. Um, it's always the demonstrators that get accused when actually it's people who react violently who are the cause, but then they blame the demonstrators. Change is not inevitable. You have to work for it. Um, he was accused of being extreme, but that's not true. He um, Oppression is extreme and complacency is not the appropriate response. Um, people, African-Americans, even then who were successful, were indifferent or didn't mind sticking with the status quo. And then people were really bitter and frustrated, wanted violence. So King was in between that. Love, it should be driven by love. Um, just like Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, you start out with love, purify your heart, and then you start to talk about the legal situation. How do we move forward? Changing the laws, changing the policies you link that to reason. Um, okay, the church as a social institution. So it should not be a social club and it should, be fo should not be focused on the next life without fixing this world. So social gospel, uh, social justice gospel is a position that says you have an obligation to question authority and to make things better. All right, the early church, they were all outside agitators. But now, now you can think about the churches you go to or the churches you read about, are they arch defenders of the status quo? Um, and then he says, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny and the American dream. And I think that's definitely true. Um, the notion that all people are created equal and they all have the same rights. That's the foundation of America. So Martin Luther King was pretty conservative. Um, this one is about institutionalized racism and the way Betsy DeVos, who is a billionaire who went to a only private Christian schools that would have cost a lot of money to go to. She was put in charge of the Department of Education. And then during COVID, the government uh, funded 245 billion to um, help students maintain, you know, stay in school or get their laptops or whatever was necessary. And she didn't even distribute it, right? She, she didn't spend it. Plus, when she did spend it, she spent it on religious schools, charter schools. She didn't um, think her responsibility as the head of the Department of Education, her responsibility is to public schools, right? Or public charter schools. Um, all right, so that, that she did that the whole four years she was there. She ignored or marginalized public education. This article is about um, systemic racism. So it's about racism in housing and how African-Americans still have so much difficulty finding, uh, uh, buying houses that have, they can get a mortgage. The mortgage pays partly on the principal of the house and partly on the interest from the bank loan so that you can build equity in your house. And then you can move to a neighborhood where the value of the houses goes up and so the, your worth, like the equity in your house goes up and you didn't do anything. So for example, 
you buy a house for, I don't know, 300 grand, and it's a 30 year mortgage, but you start paying it off 10 years, 15 years, then you can go buy a house in a bigger, in a better neighborhood, a better house. Well, you can sell this house for a lot more than you bought it for. And so even though you haven't paid off all the loan, you're gaining some interest, some uh, equity. Then you moved into the other house. Well, then that house gains even more that uh, it becomes worth even more because the richer you are, the more uh, higher in value your house tends to go. But if you're stuck in a neighborhood that blacks, that was the only place African-Americans could get housing. Most of it was rental. Some of it was loans without equity. They're just, you pay by the month and you could pay every month for 15 years. And if you miss a month, you lose the whole house because you don't have any equity. You have nothing. And then you can't move into a neighborhood where the value of a house goes up. So you build more equity. So when you find out that Black people have 10% of the wealth of middle-class people, it's because of home equity mainly, but there's other things. It's just not because they're lazy at all. They work a lot. I think they work, you know, it's just on average, poor people work a lot. And people under, it's just terrible the way the system is set up. I didn't even know this either. And that's an, an embarrassment to me. I only read a book about it about three years ago. When we were locked down and COVID, I decided I got to read some books about what's going on. Anyway, <clears throat> um, that's just one example of systemic racism. Then the school system is, is paid for by real estate taxes. Well, if you have a neighborhood of very low income rental property and very low income housing and tenants, you have um, uh, ghetto landlords who don't take care of your housing and they and there are laws where they don't really have to, um, the schools are not gonna be any good because people aren't paying very many taxes on their housing. So then in those, areas where the houses are worth a lot, they pay a lot for the public schools, but it's just like a private school because it's a bunch of rich kids that go there. So the public school system is tiered by the rich and the poor. And it, it goes on and on. <laughs> so when people say systemic racism, there really is something that they mean. Um, in my experience, uh, students who come from rural Arkansas don't understand this as much as people from big cities because their own houses don't go up in value the way the houses in cities do. Um, but if you're in San Francisco, for example, and after, at World War I, there was housing, public government built housing for people to move there and, and participate in the, the war effort but they wouldn't let black people move into those houses. They wouldn't give them jobs. It was white men, white women, then black men, and then black women. There were lots of jobs, but of course the black people got the worst job and they got the lowest pay and they were not allowed to get a house. That's the biggie over time. So there are still these ghettos in San Francisco, but someone in San Francisco would look at that ghetto and say, there is no reason for that. And the white folk who got a house, public housing, paid for the government, built equity. Then they moved to another suburb where the housing prices went way up. They got all this more equity. Like they're living way out there, or their relatives are living way out there where the housing values in San Francisco are humongous. And <laughs> <laughs> It's just incredible because it started out, you know, there were jobs and there was no reason to hire whites rather than blacks. And that's it. A century later, huge difference. Um, so 
Let's see. So here's the letter from the Birmingham jail that I would like you to read. It's 10 pages. It's not that long. Uh, I'm not asking a lot. It's an absolute classic. It's very good. So here's the outline, <clears throat> the context. Okay, the Bible has been used to justify slavery, but also <coughs> the Old Testament prophets were speaking out against injustices. And God commanded uh, uh, Moses to defy the laws of Egypt and the Pharaoh. He engaged in nonviolent civil disobedience. Amos uh, exposed the injustice to, of the Jews, um, continuing revelation. So there have been these prophets over time. And um, Jesus violated the Jewish religious laws because they weren't the will of God. Um, the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. So segregationist laws go against both the spirit and the letter of God's law and of American law. Uh, Paul risked being killed for preaching uh, about Christ and he was crucified. The Romans who oppressed the Christians didn't always agree. Uh, some of the Romans said, why are we killing these Christians? Uh, they're, they're fine people, like <laughs> they're not threatening us. But anyway, it was purely political. Um, then there's a tradition of nonviolent resistance. Jesus, Paul, the Christians, Gandhi, might doesn't make right, Socrates. Um, let's see, Aristotle and segregation. Okay, so Aristotle has some remarks that are pretty racist, um, but they don't have to be. Like he said stuff that he, I'm sure he was racist, but there's nothing in his view of flourishing that necessarily makes it racist. And so that's why I use it. But I, but you need to know there, you could make a great argument that Aristotle's racist, and then you could throw the whole thing out if you want to. Um, I don't think anything I say is true because Aristotle says it, right? Temperance is not the mean between extremes because Aristotle said it. <laughs> it is because like that's the human condition. So um, if you wanna say classical virtues or if you wanna say natural virtues, you just wanna name it. If you wanna say humanist virtues or ancient humanist virtues or whatever, just to get that name out of there, that's fine with me. Um, <clears throat> so remember the justice issues where, um, uh, control of the economic system so that people, everyone would be middle class, um, getting uh, paid a reasonable wage, dis distrib distribution of goods, rectification of wrongs. All of this stuff is racist, right? Um, so that uh, Blacks didn't have equal education to housing. That led to unequal access to education. Well, the Jim Crow laws too. Same with healthcare. Um, punishing wrongs. That was what the Black Lives Matter was about, is the way that the criminal justice system works and policing works. Um, and then sometimes the law isn't even the problem. It's the juries that apply the laws or the judge that applied the laws. Um, and so, of course, there are lots of cases where a black man would get accused of something, even if he's not guilty, but the jury would decide against them, the way they interpreted the data, the way things were presented, the fact that the black guy was poor, so he didn't have a lawyer to defend him, or, or the lawyer defending him really wanted him to lose his case. I mean, there's so many ways the system can get completely messed up. Um, Okay, so Seneca, the Stoics, again, emphasized universal laws and they engaged in nonviolent resistance. Augustine, um, St. Thomas has a natural law point of view. And then, um, so Martin Luther King appeals to divine law and natural law. And the old law is just the legalism. The new law is love your God love God and love your neighbor, and then start making decisions about what to do and creating a legal system. 
Um, but the legal system shouldn't be based on revenge um, and it shouldn't be based on nitpicking. It should be the overall case. Um, so let's see, the point of the letter is to prove that my actions were the right actions to take. Why did I take direct actions? We had tried to negotiate, to negotiate and they refused. Why didn't I wait until there was a new mayor? It wouldn't have changed anything. Why can't you wait? Well, we've been waiting for 340 years. Okay, we're demonstrating against the unjust treatment of the garbage collectors in Birmingham. It's very specific. We want them to get better pay, better conditions of work. But the whole thing, you know, it's a whole part of a much bigger system. It's just we have to pick something where we can prove through facts that this is a problem. So that's the thing about our system. You might know that any one case is within this huge context, but in a court of law, you have to prove based on sufficient evidence that there's a problem in the one particular case. Um, <clears throat> your actions precipitate violence. No, they don't. That's the people who are reacting it or reacting to us. Um, the mean between extremes, nonviolent resistance is between two unacceptable extremes, doing nothing or being violent. Um, the resistance is growing. I know this can, King knew this could turn into violence. I'm especially disappointed in the church because the church should criticize power in the light of a truly higher good international justice, natural justice, and God's law, right? Our founders believed in equality, but they were blind to slavery. Um, okay. Then, um, all right, so one last thing here is, this is kind of a summary of five of the main patterns that you see in you, throughout the semester, right? You see it with Socrates, you, and we're going to see it with Confucius, Gandhi, um, Muhammad, uh, let's see, Buddha. They had, he had a struggle with organized religion. And so in the US right now, a lot of organized religion does defend the status quo, right? We do have an empire based religion, or we have. A, a large number of um, Americans attend churches that are supporting the status quo. And that would be, uh, King would be very disappointed with that. Um, he was a radical conservative because he just wanted America to make good on its principles. Um, the founding fathers were radical progressives, religious heretics, and political traitors, as I've said before. Um, even though he was conservative, he was labeled a liberal extremist. So anybody who undermines the status quo is a liberal extremist. That's not true. Um, we have a natural capacity to recognize the truth, no matter how much we get socialized into it. Every time a child is born, a kid can figure out, I'm just as smart as that white kid, or I'm just as talented as that white kid. How come I can't get picked for the team? How come I can't go to that school? How come, you know, the teacher calls on him rather than me? I mean, kids get it. And you have to really mess them up if you're going to try to convince them that what they see with their eyeballs ain't so. <laughs> So I was glad my kids went to a very mixed school in terms of race and class and um, ethnicity and all sorts of stuff. Because if you nurture that, you know, if you, yeah, your kids, it's obvious to my kids that you start out equal and then things happen. Um, so liberal arts education at Lyon is designed to awaken your capacity for intellectual honesty and commitment to truth. And he refers to Socrates, right? And I think it's a very fair reference. Socrates felt it was necessary to create tension 
so that people would stop being complacent and think, thinking Athens is the greatest and nobody should ever question us. Well, then you're not even, you're not even a free and open society if you're not open to critical thinking. <laughs> oh boy, we're a great democracy, except don't question us. Well, that's not a democracy. All right, King Unified Reason and Faith. All right, so that was, that was a speech I gave at one of the Martin Luther King Day um, celebrations. So the next section, again, is this one is about someone who actually does a lot of research about uh, Noah seeing um, Ham naked, like what's really going on there. And that's kind of, it's just interesting, um, the curse of Canaan. So he unpacks a lot of these stories. And if you, this is my advertisement for if you want to take Mr. Beebe's Old Testament class or New Testament class, you'll start understanding, you know, what scholars have dug up about this. And you start being able to understand the Bible, I think, much better for what it is. It's a book about people seeking out a higher truth, something to live for in the context of the Judeo, the Jewish tradition, Old Testament, and then the Jesus life story. But Jesus was a Jew, you know, he wasn't a Christian. So uh, anyway, it's a, I took an Old Testament class in college and I learned a lot. I did a paper on the story of Cain and Abel and I understood that scholars disagree on what it was really about. But none of that had anything to do with me having my faith or losing my faith. It was just, oh, becoming informed about the book that informs the tradition, the faith tradition that I grew up with. That's it, there's nothing threatening. Um, this is Christian humanism, it's 13 pages. You don't have to read it. I would, you might wanna eyeball it. It, a number of the things in this, uh, Mr. Lamont said. And so just again, to reinforce that there is this whole tradition that I think every American should be aware of because our lack of awareness of that and acceptance of it is a big factor in polarization. And then humanist psychology is important because um, if you're an anti-humanist, um, you can, I don't know, I honestly think you can mess people up <laughs> psychologically if you, if you don't encourage them and believe in them and encourage people to develop their humanity. And that's what humanistic psychology does. Now you can be a Christian humanist psychologist or a you know, Muslim humanist psychologist, I don't care. You can do whatever you want. Uh, mix and match with religion. You can be uh, completely secular. But so the last thing I wanna say is you have to go find your own type of humanism, your favorite type. I had a number of possibilities back um, on this, um, right? It was quite a ways down. It was after all of this reading, there was a list of all the different types that the students brought. Yeah, here. So you can, you know, you can pick, go and go to the web and look at one of these if you want to, but mostly you just read it and you go, well, what the heck, what do I want to do? Because it's what you want to do. Oh, I just got to get the assignment done. Don't do it that way. Just ask yourself, what do I care about? Because then you'll, you'll probably get it finished a lot quicker <laughs> and you'll do a better job because you have to have some conviction if you're gonna give a decent presentation. So what I'm looking for is that you're organized. You know, this is just a couple minutes, but it's not, just reacting like you usually do. You have to be organized. You have to present, project what you want to say. You have to know, know what you're talking about. It has to be obvious you've read the article. And then you have to have a central message. So your central message could be something like, I think this view of humanism is important because our society needs it. This is where this is one aspect of American society where 
this particular branch of humanism could meet an important need, right? That would be one way to present a central message. So what is it? And, um, and then, okay, here's what it is. Here's how it got started. Here's where they're focusing in bringing about social change. Um, anyway, so that's, that is what I want from you for next time. And I will try to get whatever posts you've posted read tomorrow. Um, okay, I have something from 1.30. I have some stuff to do, but I will, I'll put it down here um, and try to keep up. I, it's not hard for me to keep up. Sometimes I, I get lazy. I don't look at it immediately because lots of times I'll look at it and nobody's handed in anything yet. But if you want to tell me via email, I just handed in something. So when you have time, could you read it? That's fine. I don't mind at all. Um, all right. So I will see you tomorrow. And remember to keep your reflections coming. By this point in the semester, I, I'm looking for your, you to be able to keep synthesizing what we've done, right? Like humanism, um, just try to go to a deeper level, not just, oh, I learned this information or Ryan said this and that was interesting. You need to go a little further. So Ryan tied this in with this other thing or Jordan and Ryan together figured out how this connects. So that's what I'm looking for you to constantly weave things together because I want you to have this very profound, deep, broad worldview by the time you get done. Um, all right, so take care. And um, once again, Alexis, I did wait until later than I should have to do this, but I hope, I hope it all works out. Take care. Bye-bye.